Lindsay. So, very proud to introduce my friend Kim Kowalski. So, I met him, when did you? I want to say it's 2014, 2015. Yeah. So, I was probably running out the halls of the Capitol, and I run into Kim, and she's uh, talking about medical marijuana, which is very unusual because she's for law enforcement. We had some people in law enforcement who were helping us with that issue then. But I thought Kim had a really good presence and a really good story to tell. So why don't we start there? Why don't you kind of talk to us about PTSD and law enforcement? I'm looking out to see if anybody's as old as me. Anybody ever see The Incredible Hulk or heard of that TV series or whatever? I got one in the house. Then. Okay. You're looking at a version of the Incredible Hulk because of some of the experiences I've been through. I'm so thankful I don't have to hold that microphone right now because the adrenaline that's flowing through me right now is a result of being under such uh, turmoil throughout my life. I started at about one year of age taking care of a brother that was born severely disabled along with a great grandmother that was passing and then my sister at the age, I was at the age of four and five, and she was 14 and dying of cancer. So I've been very aware of almost choking somebody to death while spoon feeding them soup. So it's deeply in me to care for somebody else. So it's not really a surprise that I ended up in law enforcement <coughs> instead of law school. Um, it was on it was on the agenda. I grew up in North St. Louis City. Anybody that's been through St. Louis City, you're more than aware that North St. Louis is not an easy road to go. Um, I was raised by a single mother, with two broken marriages. My older brother was a father figure and taught me that uh, most likely to succeed means most likely to survive. And so as we moved over to South St. Louis and my sister had passed and things like that, I had a gift of intelligence. So I set a goal of making certain that I would be the first to have a college degree and earn a full ride scholarship. As a matter of fact, any state school here in Missouri was going to pay my ride, but I ended up, oddly enough, instead of Washington at St. Louis Shoe. So that was a good thing for me. I did end up going through the criminal justice program, debating the law school, got accepted, didn't want to go into debt. Um, I had my mother dying repeatedly, resuscitating her at 12, and then again around 20 years of age, and working two to three jobs throughout college. So law school became like, uh, it was going to be an albatross. So I said, I'm going to change my direction. I'm going to see what it's like at a police department because I'm an adrenaline junkie. Who knew, right? Um, I have a little bit of, I don't know if it comes with the intellect or what, but uh, I like constant stimulation. And maybe it was all the trauma. But whatever it was, I did find that at the police department, I did that program. I went through the academy. Has anybody done the Citizens Academy here? I see one at the back. Has anybody ever been shot at? Let's go there. No? Okay. Anybody ever resuscitated somebody? Love you, man. Uh, resuscitated people? Okay, so you, you know, these are the kind of things. If you've not been in that Citizens Academy, I would encourage you to try that so that you have a perspective of why, why police act the way that they do. Because most of us go in it to help others, all right? So I uh, started the police department and I'm engaged to a man who's been catastrophically shot in the line of duty. And he's since passed. So, as I get into that, I'll keep this voice instead of starting to break down and cry in front of you. He was shot because he took the bullet first, right? Man said, why'd you shoot me? My husband said, because you shot me first. He shot me two times center mass, one in the arm. Couldn't kill him. But my late husband was resuscitated and worked on by the doctor that worked on John Lennon in New York. So he spent another 20 years dying in the line of duty was amazing as a police officer that I had a lot of trauma presenting, that I would see a little boy that had been anally raped by a helicopter, kid, or I would see a woman strung up with a broomstick up to her throat, strung up by her heels, or that I would pick up brain matter. 
I, I managed all of that stress pretty well. I guess, you know, God would put me in a growing season throughout my childhood. But art therapy, which I didn't even know was the name, seemed to be a way to resolve some of that. And I have a great sense of humor, but it's, you know, it's a little work, you know. When you deal with two people with their brains blown out and you're looking at that in the car, you go, well, you draw that, you draw that, and you go, I need to put a title on it. I call it Brains Matter. Yeah. So that's how you get through some of that, right? Or you see a woman who's been thrown off a bridge because she didn't like the fact that her daughter was involved in a biracial, uh, a, a, a multiracial relationship. And then she comes ashore and she has an eye missing. And she's, that's not a good sight. Now, I had terrible nightmares as a result of some of those things. And I did a piece of art for her. And it was titled EYE apostrophe M, I'm gone. Because her eye was missing. So I was finding ways to balance all of this. But it got really up close and personal whenever you're having to drag your husband out. All right? Um, died in the line of duty over 20 years. That was pretty bad. We had children. We had to leave the state of Missouri and move down to the border of Mexico. So I have an affinity for the what's going on at the border. And I thank God for all these different experiences because it's helped to grow me as a, a caring human being, right? My husband was a caring human being and he showed me a lot about agape type love versus just arrows. Learned a lot from him. But we get down there. The Mayo Clinic had said, we'll have to cut your left leg off. You have gator legs. So we're going to go down there. We're going to take care of that leg instead. So I like to say we won the battle, but we lost the war. Because everything they pieced back together ended up with two kinds of cancer, stage four. Not good. Your, your daughter, my daughters are exposed to this. Their childhood is steeped in something even more personal, I think, than perhaps what I had been exposed to. So now we're going to have a house full of traumatized females. But <laughs> that's what we're going to have. And we're going to be left alone down the border. My husband's body got blown back up to St. Louis by an organization called the Backstoppers. Um, they take care of line of duty dead families. But during the time that all the trauma of him being alive and dying, there weren't a lot of organizations out there to help us. So, you know, you have to grow a spine, don't you? Um, and so there were things that we had to do as a family that impacted us greatly. So uh, Jeffrey, and uh, that's my late husband, we were down there on the border, and I see a great need for something different than what's going on. I've left the police department where I've been an undercover prostitute. That's fun, right? <laughs> I can 1-900 I can with the best of them, all right? And I can also stand on a street corner next to people I went to grade school with that'll work in the street. It was rather humbling to know that, but for the grace of God and my intelligence, that might have been me, right? So I did that, and then I had done field training officer, and then I was in an, uh, an undercover small narcotics unit. Uh, there was a tragic uh, shooting there involved. As I came back after having my first baby, I had done... Um, White collar fraud was very good for me. I have a thing with numbers, apparently. So they put me in asset forfeiture, which is, that's very interesting too, isn't it? So I did that for quite a bit, and then I went back out in the street, they disbanded the drug unit, and eventually I ended back in asset forfeiture, and then my husband's forced out on a disability, finally. He went back, didn't have to, said I didn't want the settlement, he said this is my vocation to help others, very good at what he did also. So I leave the police department and I'm sitting around and I get a call to work on a local law enforcement block grant and it was under President Clinton at the top. And so I'm gonna be in charge of spending millions of dollars in the city of St. Louis creating safety zones around schools or childcare facilities. So if you've got a dead body in a vacant building that's derelict, that needed tearing down, I'm your, I'm your go-to. And we're going to learn how to you know, keep track of money because the auditors are going to come in and give me trauma 
every September 30th, I get nervous still. Sometimes I'll have a dream come up about, do, you know, do I have all my dollar signs right for these audits? But that was a, a very good thing. So I carried that thought with me down to the border. I'm watching and I'm knowing clearly that we had the bloods and the grips, we've had the war on drugs, and we have Mexican children on the border that are going to be recruited by the cartel. So Kimberly comes up with an idea, she's going to write billionaire and try to get a, a Disney World set up on the border of Mexico in Texas. Now, I didn't get what I was trying for. I drew up, I mean, I had water fountains, I had big old cowboy boots, I had all kinds of things. And I got back a personal response from a gentleman named Red McCombs. And he had a number of dealerships down here. He was good friends with Herb Kelleher who started Southwest. So while it didn't, it didn't happen, the seed was planted. So maybe someday, as we've seen Texas take off with four of the major Ford city, if not five, somebody will think about, hey, that crazy lady named Kimberly Kowalski, uh, AKA Kiki on the street corner, said you ought to do something down here to give people hope, to give them laughter, to give them jobs, to give them something besides a Disneyland over in Florida where they can't afford it. Let's, let's get to your introduction to medical marijuana. Oh, okay. But I want to talk about some other drugs. All right, so we're all jacked up after he dies, right? Body gets blown back, we're still down there. Um, we're gonna move back here. And I get back to my, I pick St. Genevieve because it's isolated. I can get a few acres. My late brother is dying now. I want to have five people die in, in two years in a family. And so um, I'm out there and I'm seeing the trauma for my daughters. One of them I had attempted, both of them I attempted the regular pharmaceutical route. It wasn't working. <laughs> it was really not a good idea overall. I do not. Uh, support that as your first enemy. So I started looking at medical marijuana, and then my one daughter, uh, an artist, she's going to go away to art school in um, Seattle. I'm going to take her to Seattle because art is healing. And uh, I go there. Now, I have not slept in seven years. Maybe y'all didn't sleep, but I could go. I could go because I have a brain that just is now stuck on go. It's worrying all the time. And I know that if I don't slow my brain down or find some answers for my daughters, I'm at a higher risk of Alzheimer's and other mental disorders, right? So I go to Seattle to see the daughter, and I see a shop. I swear, the name of it's Mary James. I go, oh, and I pull in there. This is a DEA-trained FBI person turning into a recreational marijuana shop. I ate one hot caramel in my life, knocked my butt off. I mean, I'm down, I'm just out, and I'm trying not to say bad words because he's tape recording. So I uh, had that hot caramel and it recalibrated my brain. I don't know if it's because I was so pure or what they gave me was so good, but what I'm telling you is that it was a solution for a worrying brain out of control. So it became a passion of mine. I've got both the children, in colleges, uh, one came here for one year and she wasn't able to settle her brain down. Wrote activities settled her brain down. The one in Seattle ended up leaving there and getting into cosmetology. She should be an actress in this. And then I'm going to find something to help others. That is my truest nature. So I'm going to find out about medical marijuana and I'm going to try to save some psychiatric beds in Southeast Missouri for veterans because you want to tell me that geriatric beds are the same as psych beds for veterans. When you have 20 to 22 plus veterans a day killing themselves, and he had me seated at the state capitol giving legislation uh, in, in the uh, legislative session. Uh, he had a gentleman losing it there where he was supposed to go talk. I wasn't supposed to talk like I wasn't supposed to talk today, but I can talk. No coffee, you'll, you'll appreciate that. <laughs> but the point being is that um, I have this firm belief that the first avenue to pursue is something as holistic as you can. Work out, get your diet straight, get your guilt con guilty conscience right. And so whether it's through a plant of marijuana where you take an Iowa 
ayahuasca drip, where you find a way to fast and release from your pineal, pineal, depends on how you want to call it, gland, your natural dimethyltryptamine, your DMT, whatever it takes to get you calm enough so that you're not feeling guilt over being a soldier. You're not feeling guilt over being a police officer taking a life. You're not feeling guilty as a mom that perhaps you encourage your daughter to pursue something in the pharmaceutical. So even, so and I, I ran into each other. I, I, want, I, want to, I want to kind of add on this here. So you mentioned ayahuasca. I did. DMT, and I think uh, something else maybe. But kind of like, I'm curious from you, like how have you heard about psychedelics and what do you know about them? I do not know a lot about psychedelics. What I know is that my brain is just an interesting part of me. If I fast, I release DMT. I have to get to a certain weight. The most days I've done is seven days without food with green tea and water. Why do I do the green tea? Because if you are aware that my husband died of two kinds of cancers, and cancer is the infestation of the campanita, the subtopic level of quarks and leptins, you think, I want to starve the cancer cells, and I want to zap them with some green tea. So I have my own DMT that I release on occasion, and I call it my God voice, okay? And it gives me my missions, my goals in life. I've never done an ayahuasca trip. I don't think that it would probably work to a greater good on me. I have a pretty good uh, coping mechanism for the things I've been through. Um, the last time I saw you, we also kind of played and talked about side by side. We did, you did. I listened. Did you teach uh, me things yeah. all the time? But you know, uh, what I'm curious from these people in your view is, you know, how, like, it seems like in law enforcement there's a number of issues here, right? You know, if you serve your career in law enforcement, you probably get exposed to traumatic events, traumatic things, right? And you've also kind of begun to understand the failures of some of the current policies, right? So, um, how do you advocate to the law enforcement community? How do you tie these things together, right? We're going to hear a little bit from some, some uh, medical professionals and healthcare specialists who have a lot more knowledge of the science and the capacity of outside and ayahuasca DMT. Right, and you've at least heard that these have great efficacy on, on, on some of these issues. But how do we reach law enforcement, you know, by connecting all these dots? Well, I would encourage everybody to understand that more people that go into law enforcement than not are there to help somebody. Um, when you go into a quasi-military organization like the police department and you take an oath to uphold the laws, then you put them in a moral quandary, is what happens. So, more of them, believe it or not, are probably in support of the passage of recreational marijuana and marijuana. Because once they instituted drug testing, all of a sudden uh, it became abundantly clear that there were a few more indulging than was, at that time it was not medical marijuana. I, I will say, uh, the thing that concerns me as I look back over my career in law enforcement, um, I have been shot at, you know, by people drunk. That's not good. They go low on the beats. You won't get your friends blown out on that one, okay? Took them down. Um, thank you, Lord, okay? Uh, but when I think about the male that was high on PCP and how it took five to take him down, there, there's got to be some understanding that, that those things aren't going to happen. And, and how do you balance that with the fact that it provides so much good to us medically if it's administered in some fashion? But I do think that as you try to present this to lawmakers who are more than aware that there's at least one million strong in some capacity called law enforcement plus their extended family, that you get us to talk about why this helps. And where you might be able to say, okay, this is why you don't want it near a, within 500 feet or 1,000 feet of this child care facility. 
parents are having a hard time having a conversation, but they're popping pills in front of their children. They're having Skittles parties. I don't know how many of y'all keep up on the Skittles phase, but boy, you know, learned a little bit there too. Um, what do I Let me ask you this question. You know, so your kind of your career has kind of spanned, you know, the era of cultural war and drugs. Correct. Right. And I think we're at a place and this is the sentiment I hear from law enforcement all the time, is that because now I understand you can't arrest your ways out of drug abuse problems, right? Because you have to find different and better solutions. And especially in terms of like nonviolent drug offenses. Um, you know, I think there's an understanding that there's a resource misallocation, right? Because you want to, you know, Kansas City, we have a 55% homicide clearance rate, right? Meanwhile, Jackson County prosecutor spends $100,000 minimum to prosecute a drug examiner, not by the drug examiner, right? So there seems to be more of an interest and an understanding that we should rethink these ideas, right? And I think that. The marijuana reform movement has given us some significant direction on that, you know, and especially in terms of psychedelics, which have enormous value for PTSD and trauma therapy and other, you know, uh, uh, mental issues, right? You know, uh, and I think the question is, you know, how do we break in to the law enforcement establishment with these kind of messages? I, I, I'm going to go back. Excuse me, that's how my brain goes. Um, I'm going to go back to the fact that, uh, as that legislator was sitting there and knowing the numbers, the dollars, when you have a budget and that's part of what you have to answer to, you, if you know the inner workings of the, of the cottage industry of prisons in the state of Missouri, and you trot in how many women are being incarcerated and thrown in a hole because they have a pill addiction versus me having to go and they released a violent offender twice back into the state of Missouri that effectively killed a police officer and I have to go back again. It's a lot easier, once again, to take care of a geriatric patient in a psych bed. It's a lot easier to take care of a woman in a prison. So if those numbers are as truthful as what I've been told, that we incarcerate women at a greater level. That's a sob story. That's the truth. And how many thousands of dollars have been spent? I will tell you that it does save some lives to incarcerate people till they get a grip on aging out of abusing narcotics. I have seen that firsthand. I have seen that. So it's, when I went to Seattle, I spoke with their law enforcement uh, assistant diversion program. It was cutting edge at that time. I tried to bring it into St. Louis City, saying you have the social worker, you have the police officer who should know their beat and say this person should be funneled over here and should not go into there. And sometimes you know, like this one's got three kids and he really is trying to kick the habit. Um, how do I? How do you make it happen with your legislators? I think you're well, going to trot well, in a we, bunch of women. Well, you know, like how do how do we specifically talk to law enforcement institutions about these issues, right? You know, like if we were going to like, and I'm kind of like, have well, you remind me? You got to go back to their quasi military. Their quasi military. They have to follow the rules. They are in a uniform. They've taken an oath. What's the law? What's the rule? Get the rules and the laws changed. Now, the testimony of law enforcement, like me, right? I mean, you know, sometimes people listen to me. Y'all are stuck in here and show us a lot. No. But the point being is that, you know, you do you, you have enough law enforcement people that go, and I, I called up a few before I came to go, well, you know it's inevitable that we're gonna lose that war on drugs. And I go, okay, so this the Monday morning quarterback. Um, don't we all know that? I mean, how many, you're, what, a, a trillion has been spent? A trillion. I mean, what we're spending on somebody stuck in a hole in a prison could probably pay for that woman and her three children, or I would have had to pay for her baloney so she didn't get locked up. So, 
I, I think you're going to have to, to get the officers completely on board, the laws have to be changed. I think that's going to be the easiest, <laughs> not the easiest, just because they have to follow the rules. Although, you know, am I going to take the woman that stole the belonging? You know, there's that latitude. Where are we at? 136. Okay, let's take some questions. Anybody? No? So this is, this is an advocacy conference, right? So the goal here is to figure out strategies to talk to different stakeholders and different and, and law enforcement which means like a huge uh, interest group. So I appreciate you talking about your trauma, and, and that's kind of what I, where I'm coming from, too. And I'm kind of new to San Diego, and I'm brand new to it. But, um, and I also like to consider that your daughter's uh, in the pharmaceutical route not being healthy, and I know that personally also with the current uh, departments on, okay, let's tone down enforcement? Well, you're seeing in St. Louis, of course, there's that, 
you know, the terminology of progressives and they're in charge and they're sure. this and they're that. Um, everybody's, we all have to get along. This is what the planet is finite. So how to do all that? I, I would think that, you know, those no-knock kind of situations, just if, you, if you're trying to take down a big cartel kind of situation, I mean, that's totally different than a person trying to use to help their mental health. And I think that that is becoming part of the norm of understanding. I would hope that, I would hope, I haven't seen the Olympic Academy program is any longer. I know that they're getting on mental health issues and how to bring a social worker in and things like that. Do I know whether or not they're going to still be hot on the no-knock kind of thing? Probably not. If I were guessing, you, you know, you don't have that um, mentality there that was there in the 90s with the war on drugs. It is, it is softening, and I know that while the media does bring up the numbers of this, that, and the other of police violence, it's not nearly the percentage that's happening within the community as it's turning on its own self. I do see hope there that law enforcement, as they are more educated, all right, but you're still going to confront what's probably an easy word, evil. You're still going to confront that person that has no soul, that may be using drugs also, that you know, you're going to have, you're going to have an ugly situation that if they're allowed to run a pump, they can, like the one gentleman that I mentioned, kill a hundred people. You know, he wasn't a good person. <laughs> he, did he do it hands-on? No, but throughout the proliferation of his drug trade. So you're going to have to watch for that. So I think that as long as you're talking about personal use and things along those lines, I don't even have a problem with I don't understand why you're not allowed to grow. Don't like to worry about uh, whether or not you're getting something cut on the street with uh, fentanyl or something like that. Uh, think mushrooms are going to be of edibles. I, I like things going in through the digestive tract or a patch more so than in through your lungs. Um, I like, um, you know, making sure that you attempt to do a whole whole approach to it. So it's the, the reason why I brought up about following the rules is you got to follow some rules somewhere. And those are the, that's the book. You all play a role in whether or not those are laws that the, the police have to enforce. We don't go and write the law and go today. Now, do we have latitude? Yeah, I've seen plenty of latitude. Praise God. And as for felony records, I think there's a way to, to abolish that from you. Earn your way back into society. You shouldn't be hampered by that. Um, I don't see why we have so many, I'm going to go back to it, i got to park on the woman thing. I don't see why we have so many women incarcerated. We have so many violent people in our world. So you're doing, you're taking an easy route out for a cottage industry that you got to go back and just wash it clean. I don't know um, where I'm going with my life, even though I've debated about running for office. Um, if I were to do that, I'll make that decision real soon once we see what the um, Senate race is going to be like here. But I'm an independent, which makes me expendable in this uh, in this race. If you don't firmly align, he knows I've uh, campaigned for both sides. And uh, if I remember correctly, at that time, Chris Coster was very good about listening, as was Todd Richardson, a uh, Republican and a Democrat there. And, and we ended up not having Coster as our governor at that time. So I think you can find the right people. I'm very good at deciding whether or not to kill you right away. That's one of my gifts. Okay. So sometimes, even whenever he introduces me to people at the state capitol, then I will take on this voice that is the no BS time. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing. I think you're wrong. You uh, And when we were in that meeting on that legislation, a uh, gentleman who was a veteran became excited about the fact that somebody was saying something that was against medical marijuana, that was his salvation, they kicked him out of the room. Now, that calmed down. 
that calmed me down because now I'm going to fight for somebody else other than just talk. And he puts me in the pente. So I get up there, and we've got two veterans, 18 pill bottles, 20 over here. They're shaking like leaves, and you've got me sitting there like, I'll kill you in a heartbeat. Look, right? So I pointed out to them, you didn't even know what you were looking at. You were looking at post-traumatic stress. He's in fear that the one thing he thinks is going to save him, you're listening to somebody talk against it because they have a police uniform on. Well, I used to wear a uniform, and I'm here to tell you that was post-traumatic stress called fight or flight. And he thought he needed to start chattering out loud and, <sighs> and shaking his head and such. Now, that legislator heard me. Good thing he did. <laughs> and he found him and he apologized for it. So there are people that you can take in to lobby and help you speak for these laws that need passing, modifying. Uh, what's the big, you yeah, another big word up there. I can't remember. My five dollar word can slow. But the point being is that there are changes happening. There are a lot more people like me than you think that are willing to support you from the police department. And keep the dialogue going. But it's not about, and, and I, I, I take a little bit of exception to that about just following the rules because, believe it or not, there is a lot of mediation that goes on within us as officers that I have seen. Now, like any other profession, you probably got like five or so, ten percent probably is a throw out or something. I don't know. That, and that kind of seems kind of high. But um, I, I would encourage all of you go through the Citizens Academy. <coughs> Get to know the officer. Make sure that maybe you get one like me that will go testify at the local level. You do want to work on drug awareness programs for your children because we don't need um, we don't need a level of addiction. We need treatment. Well, thank you, Kim. I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs>